Opinions, viewpoints, and beliefs presented on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the management, the affiliates, and broadcast partners, or the sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Scarefest Radio, the radio you can see. And hello and good evening, everyone, and welcome to Scarefest TV, the original broadcast date, July 28th, 2023, Scarefest 15 is like two, three weeks away, something like that. I don't know. I, it's just, it's scary every time somebody posts about it. Um, Tonight, my co-host is the lovely and talented Katie Followell. Welcome back to hello. the show, Katie. This is like hello. bang, bang for you. You were just here like I know. I'm two, excited. Two or three days ago. And our guest tonight is, of course, Melanie Kinneman. And um, first of all, I, I'm excited for this for no other reason. I could tell you were excited to do it, and that just tickles me shitless. What can I tell you? <laughs> it doesn't take a lot to thrill me, I guess. <laughs> Well, I can. You were enthusiastic. You were enthusiastic about coming on the show. You shared it. What I'm saying is, you shared it, and that's you know, mm -hmm. a little promotion is good for you. Everybody, of course, Melanie. Uh, um, Friday thirteenth, part five. The the one that kind of, I guess, when that was out, that kind of tripped everybody up because they're figuring out how Jason. I know spoilers because somebody may not have seen it yet, but who knows. Um, now, everybody, of course, now we were, and we'll, we'll be covering it during the show. Um, incidentally, yes, half hour part, uh, Mark, I do have two more names to drop, celebrity guests to drop. Um, and, oh boy, and everybody wants me to do scary Yoki. Uh, Jake Godbold just posted in the chat room. I have no idea. The, um, now I, I'm just going to go ahead and just, uh, break the ice here by having, Asking you a terribly, terribly inappropriate question. And the reason I'm going to do it is I ask, I'm going to go ahead and get it out of the way. I asked the same question roughly to Deborah Voorhees, but I've waited a while. But I've just decided to just go ahead and just knock it out of the park here. When hey. you did, when you did Friday 13th Part 5, did I remember that time period? Not a there were the only woman in that movie that wore a bra was the nurse in the last scene. The old woman sitting by the bed. Was that a wardrobe um were you all just that cool or was that like a wardrobe um they when you walked in they pointed at you <laughs> and said it? I did, I gotta know. I wore when you first see me at the halfway house, the pine. Okay. You see me, I'm dressed very conservatively yes, and yes I, absolutely and i have everything you're supposed to have as a girl yeah. and uh underwear wise i don't mean equipment and so <laughs> i get there with my clipboard and i do my thing as you get halfway through the film maybe not halfway um it's all the chase scenes the running i'm in the jeans so the director pull, st says cut and he pulls me aside and he said hose her down and lose the bra and I said, why? And he said, why do you think? And uh, he said, it looks better wet. But again, I was so into what I was doing and playing the character and trying to uh, concentrate, you know, that I was not aware that you could see through the shirt. At that point, it didn't matter anyway. But I swear to you, I was not aware that it was stopping wet and you could see through it. But it was, a, it was an absolute decision made by the producers and the director. I, I, okay, in, in all fairness, I will say, I, I'm not going to say I didn't look closely, but I, of, of, of all of the so-called, well, the, the brawless ladies, you were obviously the most conservative, and, and actually, I would, I would even stop short, I wouldn't say you could see through it, but I could tell mm -hmm. the water was cold. 
Well, there are some screenshots. There's some <laughs> there's some screenshots from the film now, and they made posters out of them. So I'm sadly well aware that you can see everything through some of the shots with the lighting and the wet shirt. Oh, so okay. I, uh, again, it, it, it was a, a concerted decision effort made by the powers that be that they needed to see breast to scissors. <laughs> I get they mean. <laughs> It was an eighties thing, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I, I thought they're still doing it now. They're probably showing more than they did in the eighties. Well, yeah. I mean, there's they're showing more <laughs> now, right? Um, I I don't I don't go to movies mm -hmm. anymore. Um, oh, I don't as, as long as long as as uh, Disney movies, Marvel is oh, okay. until okay. they start. That's 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 my thing. Okay, I I see it. It's already on tape. No, I, I can't believe that's how it started the interview. Um, I can't either. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it went right to the breast shots. Well, I, I couldn't help. I rewatched the movie, mm -hmm. and and that was something that stuck in me. Okay, now the reason is I'm an old. I I I'm I'm, I'm getting to the age, and I look back, and I dated a lot of girls back in that time period. Bragger. And every one of them had on undergarments. Every one of them. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I'm just, okay. <laughs> Now, okay. now the serious question is: I do want to know, um, what's it like to be part of? I mean, it's let's face it: as far as it's a legendary franchise, mm -hmm. there's just no getting around it. Here you are, you're in, you know, uh, you're the franchise. I'll put it this way: went on how many movies after Part Five? Ten. Uh, how many are after Part Five? Is a good question. There, I know it uh, went up to to ten. I think it's uh, but then, no, there's tw at least 12. God, okay. I should, I'm Googling it. I'm embarrassing myself. I should know that answer. <laughs> but I think there are 13. Okay. So the question stands. Um, I know you didn't realize it, or did you even realize it at the time? Because that was part five. Here mm -hmm. you are. You're going into something that's become a horror legend. No, I did not. I did not. And it took me many years after, to tell you the truth. I'll tell you how I found out. Going to conventions. They The fans told me it's... Uh, iconic you know You're but right. do, i did not know i didn't know soon after but i didn't start doing conventions until 2011 i think i was late to the game because uh, for a lot of reasons but anyway um that's when i found out the okay. fans um now okay now i guess now as far as movie genres what is your favorite movie genre? I've already established. I'm a superhero guy. I love I love the Avengers. So I mean, uh, what if you had to go to the movies next week? What would you like to watch? I like suspense. I like really intricate stories. Um, I'm not a horror fan. I'm just not. And um, my favorite kind would be The Exorcist, Jaws, Straw Dogs. Movies like that. Okay. They're intricate um, plot, and there is some some suspense and some fear, but I don't like all the gore. Understood, understood. Katie, over to you. So, I read a lot about this movie, and the director seemed like an interesting dude. Um oh. Did you know that you were auditioning for a Friday the 13th? I did. They they did tell me. But okay. uh, but know that that didn't mean anything to me cuz I hadn't seen any of them. Yeah. But my agent said Friday the 13th is a horror movie. There's been a few of them. So I knew it was a horror movie, but again, I didn't know what it entailed. After I got cast in it, which was pretty quick after the audition process, I said I need to see part 4 because I haven't seen any of them. And part four will help me understand where we're going with this, so. Um, like, what have, like, I don't know. I, I creeped on your whole life before this. So, <laughs> like, I noticed that you've also done television and uh, plus obviously film and stage work. Yeah, what I did a lot has, of How is the, what's the most fulfilling to you? What What's... What makes you happiest? They all have their pluses. 
I, I love theater. That's where I started out, live stage, because it's live, it's immediate, the audience is right there. Yeah. Uh, and you're putting it right there, and there's no do-over. There's no take two. So that's very exciting for an actor, keeps you on your toes. And, and like I said, to have the feedback from the audience immediately. The one TV show I did, Cheers, was like that. They shot it like a, a live show. Um, we rehearsed all week like a theater piece. And then Friday yeah. night, it was a live audience and we shot it in front. So, but but I like film. It's different. They all, like I said, they all have something that really is fulfilling, but they're all different. I like, I did see you were on Saturday Night Live. That was live, um, yeah. Was, was the internet telling me the truth that you were with John Belushi and Gilda Radner in the yeah, scene? I was in yeah, I was in very early in the in the season. You know, I we did it in 70, <laughs> 78, so they were still alive and well and kicking and doing the show. Uh, it was very exciting to work with them. Yes, John Belushi played. We, we, it was a Charlie's Angels spoof, and Belushi played Charlie. Oh, the, I, I, I don't know, Charlie. like a Saturday Night Live geek, and also like I do community theater, so I have this like drawn interest to stage work. Did yeah. you do? Like, like musicals or more stage I, show? Like I did both. I did drama. I did Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, which is very heavy drama. Yeah. I did musicals. Um, I like both because I started out as a singer dancer, and and yeah. I wanted to be an actress. But my way to get in was through the dancing and stuff. So I did start out doing musical, but I got a lot of roles that led me to the dramatic stuff. So they're both well, rewarding. They're different. It's like the difference between co comedy and tragedy and, you know. Yeah. it's. I was wondering about that. I was like, well, because I was trying to find what, like, like your stage work, just to be like, I don't like this. I love that show. But uh, I, Saturday Night Live was a, an animal among uh, of itself. It was so different and so thrilling. And I got to work. Uh, Gilda Radner wasn't in the scene, but I got to work with everybody else. And the Rolling Stones were the opening act or the musical guest. Oh my so, yeah, oh. you imagine that. The Rolling Stones were the musical guest that night. <laughs> that that was yeah. a good fucking week. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Was it really hectic to do that? Like, like. Yes. I yeah. did like it's very one, fast. It's done very yeah. fast. I had done one summer stock production and just that, like trying to get ready for a show in two weeks, it was just mm -hmm. mind blowingly hard. So oh, I've, I've always wondered how those do it. So, or how those actors do it. Yeah. So, you know, uh, a, little, a little smidgen, but <laughs> um, how did you feel like your theater background helped you prepare for Friday the 13th? Like, did you? Like, I feel like you researched character a lot. Yes, absolutely. It was a great training. I think every actor should start on the stage. So you're doing that. It's very smart. It trains you for everything. Um, it really helped me with Friday the 13th because you develop the character before you ever set foot on the set. So if you have all the backstory and you develop that, once you're on the set and you're working with the other actors and they're shooting, you have more time to develop and change things about that character for me, Pam Roberts. And that's one great thing about film is that you can, uh, you're, you're, you're shooting for a while. In my case, it was two months. So I lived yeah. with her for two months. Yeah. It, like I was reading, you had talked a lot about like, they said like, Oh, you're blonde and you mm -hmm. can run. And you were like, well, I've, I've got that advantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, it was very interesting to read the background of that. Like I, I loved it. Uh, they what that was interesting some really character? Yeah, they weren't that interested in character development. Uh, that's for sure. They were interested in, I guess, blonde and 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 physically fit that I could run and do the action stuff, and that I was willing, uh, like Wes said, to take my bra off. So, but as we got into it, the character developed. And I was able to bring something to it, you know. That's why I love badasses, badass bitches <laughs> in horror movies. Because like they they're they're more <clears throat> than like the stereotype. And I, I just am obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. What what is we're I, a quarter of the hour. Do you need to interrupt us or can I keep talking? 
No, I need to interrupt you. But that's good. Okay. You finally so. watched your clock. Good you job. Guys are I'm good. <laughs> I've done Everybody. this a few times now. <laughs> we will be right back after this commercial break. Horror. Movie. Fans. Four. Life. On Facebook, find us. Four watch parties. Four news. Four memes. Four friends. Four life. Horror movie fans for life. Join us. And welcome back, everybody, to Scarefest Television. Guest is Melanie Kinnaman. Okay, uh, Melanie, first of all, we got to tell you what's going on in the chat room. First of all, everybody loves your hair. Oh, just, great. Just, Thank just, you for the feedback. Yes. Now, everybody can just shut up about our damn hair. Now, Aww. get to the serious questions. Now, um... Somebody in the chat room says, what's this about you being in a band? Oh, yeah. Uh, I did post something about that. I was in a band in the 1990s. Uh, the Sunset Strip, I don't know if everybody knows about the Sunset Strip in, in Los Angeles and how big it was. And so I did all the clubs on the Strip. And we headlined. And the name of the band was Bliss. And it was kind of an alternative pop very hard music with uh poppy vocals and i had great guitar players from guns and roses i mean they had been in guns and roses and la rose and all these other bands la guns so i was very fortunate i'm trying i'm trying to picture what that music sounds so you but you were the vocals <laughs> It's a lot. I was a lead singer. It was a lot like it was edgy. It was a lot like um, mm -mm -mm. Uh, Oasis, um, Blur, but with heavy, heavy guitar, heavy like a not heavy metal, but a very heavy grungy like Shakespeare's Sister. Does anyone know that that group? They we probably like, do in the chat room. I'm an idiot from the Shakespeare's I Sister. Know. The vocals were very uh. melodic. <laughs> Uh, I guess the important question here is, could you dance to it? Yes, but it was more of a edgy, like, heart. I don't know. You don't dance to the, heart. The, the heart? Yeah. No, in my day, we danced to heart. Thank you very much. Oh, did you? Well, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I could see that. Yeah. I, I was reading about that, too, and I was like, damn, she can do it all. She's on. a triple threat. Yeah, um, we successful. We did get a development deal with uh, with uh, Polygram Records, and it was just timing. It was the music wasn't what they wanted at that time. They were switching it to uh, more of a garage band thing. So, had it been successful, you would have known about it. <laughs> Locally, they knew about it. We were a big deal here and very popular, but in the national scene, no. Um. Now, we're going to go ahead, and I, I want to go ahead and address the elephant in the room. All of the series for convention fans, I'm going to say the convention fans, because a lot of people, it's not even on the radar. The horror convention fans are worried about the SAG strip and right. how it's going to affect them and your interaction with them. Um, well, go ahead. Well, I just, let's talk about what we talked about before the show. Let's uh, Your position on it. I've already, here, everybody, I'm going to start by saying, I support what they're after. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. Melanie came in and kind of filled me in on the direction that it's taken, and that's where I was hoping it would. Yeah. I thought it should stay away from, but now take it from there, Melanie. I agree. It, we're, we're fighting for uh, major issues, very serious. AI, residuals getting paid a fair wage. The wage has not gone up in 30 years. 
uh, people can't afford their insurance, their homes, their, you know, and all the money's going to producers. So we just want our fair share, especially with streaming. We're not getting that. Mm -hmm. That being said, and people can look that up. I don't want to bore you with all the details. That being said, I think that Screen Actors Guild, AFTRA, should not be involved in the convention scene. And I'll tell you why. They are giving waivers to film and television mm -hmm. productions. And they're working right now. They're giving them waivers because they're ind independent, okay? And they're allowed to work. I think fair is fair and no one should be allowed to work. Don't cross the picket line. Now I understand they've given these waivers and their reasons for it. If you're going to do that, then stay out of the conventions because there's nothing more independent than that. And we're not striking against that. So also during the strike, the actor cannot work. We need to go to the conventions. We need to um, interact with the fans. And if fans are interested in an autograph, we need to do all of that. Um, so my, my standing on that is that when I come to the shows, I will be bringing pictures I will be signing anything you want, the stuff you bring, things that I have on my table. I will be answering any of your questions about anything I've done, except for the new project I did, which is a major studio project. And I've been told I cannot speak about it because it's still happening. So I abide by that. Mm -hmm. But I don't abide by the rule that I cannot speak about a film that I did 38 years ago, that I can't answer questions about that. Now, I understand the promoters are making a decision. I guess they cannot do a Q&A. That's their, that's their thing. They're the promoter. They're the owners. I have nothing to say about that. I will abide by anything that the promoters plan to do. But I don't want the fans concerned that when they come to my table to meet me, that they can't talk to me. They can't ask me questions about Pam Roberts or Friday the 13th or anything I've done, best of the best, anything that is in the past. You can't talk to me about the present new project I've done, which most people don't even know because it's not out yet. So that's the, uh, my statement. No, it, it, it was very, it was beautiful and eloquently put. When this first started, um, you know, we talked we talk to some actors and they were like, well, no, you know, yeah, we understand we can't talk about the, the current stuff, but mm -hmm. there's no way because, as I pointed out, um, there's nothing that you're going to do at our convention or any other convention that's going to make Paramount or whoever money. They, well, you know, the union <laughs> thinks that we will. By talking about it, I don't know what the logic is, but the union thinks because Friday the 13th is a Paramount, mine was a Paramount, and some of the others. And then some of the other things I did were major studio. They think somehow something's going to come from it for them. That's not true. You're really only benefiting the actors, to tell you the truth. And we're unemployed because of the strike, except for the lucky ones that got that waiver. That waiver. The, uh, and, and, of course, and, and I'm going to throw this because it shows how smart I am. She loved my analogy of saying this is like if UPS went on strike. And they said, okay, we're not delivering your package. And we want all the shit we brought you the last year or two years back. And yeah. They, yeah, they just went door to door and said, no, you can't have that. They told me that I can't speak about Pam Roberts, but I can talk about my own personal life. Now, wh who cares? What fan is going to come to my table and ask me about my personal life? Well, obviously, right. I'm the type that would. But, me. But, but, they yeah. want to know, know about what it was like to do this film, to play this role, uh, what were the conditions, what were the actors, they want to know the back behind the scenes stuff. Otherwise, why are they coming to meet me? Absolutely. So, we, were, we were told we couldn't bring pictures, they had to purchase them from, some, I don't know, a third party. Rest assured, I am bringing my own stuff that will be at my table. Obviously, you are all free to bring your own things and I will sign them. That's it. I'm probably going to get in trouble. I don't know. But um, I, I will abide by anything the promoters want to do because they're the boss. And I'm sorry if they decide to not do a Q&A. 
Now, because for I... the record, right now, uh, oh. and this is something that the fans need to hear too, we have made no changes. Oh, in, good. in And we actually might have a loophole because most of our celebrities were signed to do our con, our con before you went before on the strike. strike. That's it. That's the loophole. But now they're kind of changing that. But no, no, no. <laughs> I you read can't that. change it. No, that's my point. <laughs> so, I hope the promoters um, are treated right on this. That's all. I, I I hope that they have looked into this legally and and the, have okay. Their- now I'm not I I'm not going to get into union mm-hmm. politics or whatever you want to look at that. But I will say one thing: if one fan convention. One try, I should say, one independent true fan convention is hurt by this. <laughs> Horror fans will never forgive the union. No, no. And because they, this is, well, I mean, we are the bridge mm-hmm. to get let the fans touch skin, if you will, you know, get in your face. Uh, and quote the fans, you. Yeah, and the fans are the ones that are going to the movies and making everybody rich, except the actors. But you know what I mean. <laughs> The top, the top actors are rich, but they're making the producers wealthy. They're, they're, they're making the studios profit, and so they should not be stepping on the toes of the fans. That's my personal opinion. And you are stepping on their toes when you're telling them that in their own backyard they can't go and meet one of their favorite actors or actresses. Um, now, the only other thing I want to add to this, I went on the SAG website to read their Q&A. Mm-hmm. I have never seen so many depends since I left the Walmart diaper aisle. Wow. Every question, you know, uh, can I do so and so? And it says depends. Oh. It depends. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. They in other words they can't even give Hmm. There should uh, be some I, ways I, to give straight answers where you know it was straight. Yeah, I did read some of that. I scrolled down just to find out what we can and cannot do. Uh, there were a lot of nebulous answers. I'm hoping, because I'm not doing any conventions until September and October, so I'm hoping that they kind of get their you-know-what together about the conventions. We, we, we can say it really is important. It really is important uh, to, to the fans mostly, but also to the actors who are coming there. What about all the people that bought tickets already for this and now they're told they can't ask you a question? About something you did 150 years ago. That and and you alluded to it before. The okay, now some of our guest list are you know working Huge. actors. Yeah. Okay. They're yeah. They're you know they're they're yeah. working actors. They they they've got a paycheck waiting on them. Mm-hmm. And they're still doing the conventions though, aren't they? Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, we a lot of our can Scarefest is built around. 80s and 90s for okay some of those actors this is how they make their living now they mm. do these cons they do you know they're do a lot they're, yeah. yeah they they do this and I, I mean i hate to just come out and say they need the money but yeah. i mean That's they true. This there is are what they some do that do living. every week there are some i see out every week or every two weeks or at least bi-monthly and yeah that's right. You're right. I never thought of that. That's that's their paycheck. And uh, and so yeah. And even even if okay, even the ones that only do uh, independence, it's, mm-hmm. it's it's like poor Felicia Rose must be all over the map right now because mm-hmm. she does a, her a ton of movies, mm-hmm. and I couldn't mm-hmm. even tell you which ones are studio movies or and are not. I think a um, lot of them are independent. Yeah. Yeah, you know. So the and but it, it once again, if this strikes, then it gets in and hurts the independence. Um, you know that's it's a whole nother thing. It's just it's a thing, and but um, there you go. Uh, that's everybody, the strike is is a is short one. I I'm not that optimistic, but I'm I pray that things get resolved. That they come to the bargaining table. They being the producers come to right. the bargaining table, Screen Actors Guild after, and just. Be fair. Just be fair. And then we can all go back to work. That's that's what we're all hoping for. But mm-hmm. everybody, we want to, that's one thing. We try to be as transparent as we can. 
at the Scare Fest. And so we we wanted everybody to know um, what what well, I mean what we know. And um, mm-hmm. now I could go in and answer every time somebody posts about it online, and but even then. I was doing that, and then I had an actor come up and say, "No, that's not right." Even though I've just quoted really? other actors, so you know, yeah. it is. It's it, that that's kind of the way it works. But so the fans are the concerned, out. right? The fans are concerned. They are. They the 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 heavy duty fans are. Okay. Yeah, the heavy duty fans are concerned because they come for the Q and A's. Right. See, you know, Joe. Yeah. You know, Joe Blow in in Falmouth, Kentucky that might want to come and get your autograph because they remember going to the drive-in and seeing that movie, Mm -hmm. they don't care about all the rest of this stuff. They just want to meet you. Mm -hmm. And and they... That's one thing. We have more... And we saw it a lot last year. We're seeing it this year. Fans that have never been to a convention. Wow. Yeah, we're getting a lot of that. A lot of that. That's exciting. All right, we're going to take a little break now, everybody. We're going to do our uh, half-hour, um, our 30-minute mark uh, announcements and our plugs. First, we're going to tell you about one of our sponsoring vendors, JP Horror Collection. JP's Horror Collection. You'll find great prices, fast shipping, excellent customer service. Check out all their horror collectibles and home decor. And don't forget to take a look at their sales section. When you get to their website, jpshorror.com, jpshorror.com, check them out. And they have their, they've got their selection sorted by movie. You can go and look at home decor. They got a whole section on skulls. Where, where can you go wrong with a whole section on skulls? So check out their website, jps, jpshorror.com, and a supporter of the Scarefest. Announcements for tonight. First off, Christine Romero. Christine Romero, who you might remember from a little show called Creep Show. Also was in Monkey Shines Down the Dead. But, and uh, I believe she was married one time to George Romero, so she's got that going for her. But, Creep Show. Christine Romero is booked for this year. Next up, I'm going to give you another Creep Show star. Daryl Ferrucci. Daryl Ferrucci is coming to Scarefest Creep Show. Chud. Okay. I'm trying to remember without looking it up what Chud stood for. Um, somebody in the chat room will do it. Uh, underground Dwellers. Something Underground Dwellers. Human Underground. C. I forget to see. Somebody in the chat room will tell me. Anyway, the burning I'm gonna Google it. Yeah, I'm not going to Google it. But. <laughs> Chud. Anyway, Creep Show. That's what he's coming for. We're having a little Creep Show reunion. Daryl Cannibalistic Human What is it? Cannibalistic Humanoid Underground Dwellers. There, I knew everything, but I forgot cannibalistic. I forgot cannibalistic. (laughs) Now, on with our announcements. Central Kentucky Mystical Market, Lexington's premier monthly psychic and holistic event going on this weekend, July 29th, 30th, Saturday and Sunday, Clarion Hotel on Newtown Pike in the Paddock Ballroom. Check them out, 1950 Newtown Pike. Right as you get off the interstate, Scarefest Horror Film Festival is still taking submissions. you got one month. If you've got an independent film and you want to get it in a film festival, we are still in the judging process. We are taking them till the end of the month. Scarefest Horror Film Festival. So if you need to get your film in a film festival, this is your last chance with us. Then, yes. The Sleepaway Camp cosplay that I will be doing, I am 22% towards the goal that I would need. And that you can you can sign up on this for as low as $1. $1 to read my recovery blog. It's all about me getting over the recent heart attack that I had. So I just wanted to uh, 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 remind you all of that. You can find that at scarefestradio.com or on my Facebook page. Look me up for foresight. Now, that's at 100 people. If I get 150 people, I will do that cosplay with a tramp stamp. A temporary tramp stamp, but a tramp stamp nonetheless. So, there you go. Patreon.com slash Radio. If you want to do it that way, Patreon.com slash Radio, Or, like I said, look me up on Facebook or go to the website. And finally, once again, 50 push-ups a day during August. I don't like children. 
I hate doing push-ups, but I am doing 50 push-ups a day. I have accepted the challenge for St. Jude Children's Hospital. Look on the website or on my Facebook page and there's links to uh, make a donate. And you're not donating to me. All I get out of it is a t-shirt and pecs. That is all I'm getting. I, I got a t-shirt and pecs. But 50 uh, push-ups a day. St. Jude does a lot of work. The kids do and their families do not pay for this. St. Jude's Re- uh, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Support them and you get to... um. You listen to me bitch and moan for 30 days or 31 days about doing push-ups because I'll be doing them five at a time because I'm a big puss. Okay, back to the show. <laughs> Good for you on the push-ups. We'll see how that goes. I, uh, I, my money's I, on you. I can do. I'll do if I do two an hour and just stay up all day. I'll do it. Yeah. But <laughs> you know, you'll do more I, than that. I am not usually this magnanimous about my time and energy. In other words, I don't do charity stuff. And so this this is my little tip, tippy toe in the water. And I've got enough support so far that, yes, I will be doing it again uh, for somebody. So, and this is all about me having a heart attack and saying, fuck it. I'm, a, I'm going to, I'm going to get, not only get better, but be a, I'm going to be a douche about it. I'm going to, in other words, I'm going to rub everybody's noses in. Well, congratulations on the recovery. Good for you. You well, look great. You look well, great. Well, thank you. Healthy. Thank you. Very healthy. I, I did. Uh, I did join the Patreon um, because I really want to see that cosplay happen. So I'm, <laughs> I see the tramp stamp. Uh, hell yeah! Is I can't I, wait. I have serious doubts whether the tramp stamp will happen. I really do. But I am. I'll bring I, the I, warm washcloth that will get with the tattoo <laughs> on. I mean. <laughs> But but like I said, I will stick to it. I I'm a man of my word, and um, good for you. Honestly, honestly, a, a light version of the cosplay may happen because here we are. We're less than ninety days out, and I've only got twenty two people. But it, I do appreciate every damn one of them. And um, so they'll come through. They'll come through. So um, and uh, and help the children. Sarah McLaughlin song. I need a, I, I need a Sarah McLaughlin song to play. That's will people, it. Will people will step up and help St. Jude's? Okay, um, let's see. We're uh, we still got a few minutes left in this quarter. Announcements take a lot of time this time of year. Oh, by the way, um, this month we will be releasing all the names, everybody, of the uh, seminar speakers. Uh, the schedule is on the website. So if you're wanting to know who will be speaking and when they will be speaking, they are that is posted on the website. Um, yeah, I put it in the menu. I, I remember doing the page. I did put it in the menu. Um, okay, let's go by. Um, now, the worst thing, and Melanie's going to hate me. The worst thing about researching you, Melanie, everything you've been in, none of it's streaming free. It's all, no. or, or I should, shouldn't say, it's not included in any of my stuff. So, um, uh, I, I, I was good, and I almost dug through my VCR tapes because I think I had best of the best on videotape, but I did, I did not go ahead, and I still own VCR. Um, best of the best. What was your part in Best of the Best? I play Eric Roberts' girlfriend, but don't don't watch, don't spend the time watching it because I was cut. All my scenes were cut, so it's very funny when people will come to the to the conventions with the poster and have me sign all this stuff you know i remind them that i'm dead that i'm i'm not in it I, i'm in the c- credits so you see right. that i'm in it which is why i still get residuals and i'm on you know uh on the uh, the uh imdb but yeah they decided to cut any love interest in this movie because they wanted to just have room for all the fight scenes i kind of understand that because it's a karate movie but on the other hand uh, he's a human being, and he does have a personal life. They didn't put any importance in that. Um, and it was an audition. I mean, the process, this is going to kill you. Uh, it was a month and a half. I think I did 15 callbacks for this role. I mean, guys, really, if you're going to go to that effort, at least leave one scene in <laughs> the damn Yeah. I, I practically gave blood in those auditions. I'm on the set working my ass off. And, you know, at least keep a still of me, something. 
Then, no. now, okay, Maybe now that you've ex- or something. Yeah, people <laughs> wouldn't believe, I'm telling you, no one would believe I was in it if I wasn't in the credits. You're probably, okay, you're probably right. And the, now, I'm glad you explained that so eloquently because I was actually, that was going to be my kind of my follow up. I read one of the things and it said you were Eric Roberts' girlfriend in the movie. On IMDb, your character is called The Woman. The Woman. The Woman. And add insult to injury, they didn't tell me. I went to the big cast and crew screening, big party. No one told me. I'm there with my agent. We're sitting there watching this thing. It goes, well, where's the scene? I said, no, it's coming up. It's coming up. Nothing. I said, oh, there's another one. Wait, wait, wait. Nothing. This and then the whole movie's over, the credits roll. I was devastated. Um, I can't tell you how terrible it was. To, to find out that way, at least guys, clue me in. For, call, call me on the phone and say, by the way, you're not in the movie. So. That I, sucks. I, like, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, the way, the way the industry is and the way life is now, Thank God I'm in the credits because I really truly believe people would say she's lying. She was never in that movie. And I'm telling you, <laughs> folks, I auditioned 15 callbacks for that role. If you didn't care that much about it, you could have given that thing to anybody because you're going to cut it. I don't. I, anyway, I could bitch about this for an hour and I won't do that. I'll well, bitch about it. something else. <laughs> you're better than me. I'd be like, I'm going to bitch about this for an hour. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is when people come with the, with the big poster from Best of the Best and they have me sign it. And I do like, I tell them before, you really want me to sign? The, oh, yeah, this is great because you're not in it. Sign it. You're in the credits. Yeah. If you should just start um, signing like random names on it. Be like, oh, I'm the woman. I'm the, well, I should just put the woman. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> You got to get Eric, Eric Roberts is bitch. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, anyway, that's I, the story on that. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, like. Oh, I got a million stories. Yes. A million stories. Sometime we'll talk about Harvey Weinstein. The next time I'm on the show, we could do an hour about that. Okay. I'll, that. I'll just do that. Yeah. I'm still waiting. I'm gonna, yeah. If, if I'm you're wanting waiting. to tell those stories yeah. after after what I put you through, I, I hey, that sounds great to me. Yeah, it's a sad story, but uh, you know. Um, 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 okay, back to what the, all all the fans. Now, the fans. Okay, first of all, you all are really sad tonight. All these interactions and all you all are talking about is her damn hair. Oh, quit, tell, quit telling me how beautiful she be is. Worse. <laughs> could be worse they could be saying god she's boring what an old bag no 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 are no. you know horror fans better than that when, okay how now you said you didn't start even start doing conventions still how, what, how long ago i started in 2011 or i very okay. first was a monster mania yeah now, they had been asking me for years but i didn't want to do them i'm because i have asked this before people okay now you were not a horror fan per se. Right. Uh, so I'm sure you did not frequent horror conventions, let mm-hmm. alone be a guest. How long did it take for you to get used to horror fans in that I have seen them walk up to tables and ask, why did you turn left? It's, and they have the lines memorized better than you did. They do. <laughs> it's fascinating. It's kind of nice to have people be that loyal to a film. And to the character that you played, you know, you have no idea when you're doing it. All I wanted was hopefully to portray a character that you would somewhat like, have empathy for, and hope that she doesn't get killed. That was my goal. But I meet fans and it it had such an impact on their life. Some people were bullied as, you know, teenagers, and they said that my character kind of gave them um, a strength. Who knew? Was it kind of crazy to, well, for your first horror convention, like I, we had Brian Brimmer last year, it, mm-hmm. it was the first time at our show, and he was like, I just was amazed at how loving fans are. Mm-hmm. Did you have that same kind of experience of just like, holy shit, this is, 
awesome. Like because Friday the Part Five was controversial, which I did not know when I was doing it. But the aftermath, the year or two after all the hatred that came, and then the hatred towards me. So when I went to the convention, I was expecting maybe some onslaught of hatred. I got mostly love, great love. I was so appreciative to the fans, but there is still some of that animosity, like it was my fault that Jason wasn't in it. Listen, people, it's just a movie. I was playing a character. I had nothing to do with Roy. I mean, to me, he was Jason. So uh, lighten up about Jason and Roy. <laughs> Yeah. As we say at Scarefest, we do a whole lot of calm the fuck down. So like, calm the fuck down about Jason. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, everybody, we're going to do our yeah, 45. The love, the love has been intense coming towards me, though. I will say that. And, I, and I'm very grateful. Let's do our 45-minute commercial break and get our bonus weekly spotted. Then I see some questions finally popping up in the chat room. And we will, we will uh, get to that. Spirit Mechanics, 1018 East New Circle Road. I don't even have my commercial notes ready. I'm just going to tell you, these guys are great. They have a brick and mortar store now. Uh, all kinds of metaphysical stuff. Check them out online, spiritmechanics.com. Buy a deck of tarot cards. Go in for um, Steve's, uh, uh, Tyree's. He does, he does healing with sound. It sounds... Hokum. It sounds like hokum, but I'm telling you, I've tried it and it really does work. If you got chronic pain, in my case, it was after Scarefest last year, and my legs and hips thought I thought I was going to die. I couldn't hardly walk across the parking lot to where he was working, but I was very glad I did. 1018 East New Circle Road. Check them out, or just go online, spiritmechanics.com, find out more about my boys. Okay, we're going to go to Bonehead Weekly now. Hey, Scarefest fans, this is Joe Lewis, and if you're freaking out because I'm in blue, so am I. It just happened. This is weight loss and trying to find shirts. So tonight, I want to revisit a couple of movies that get just, to me, are a little unfairly crapped upon. And because we have our guest, Miss Kinnaman, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite final girls, and we'll hopefully be interviewing her this fall on a great final girl panel, what I really want to talk about is just the hate that Friday the 13th Part 5 gets sometimes. I actually like the idea that they tried to change it up and it was somebody parading around as Jason and it isn't necessarily... Oh, spoiler alert if you haven't seen it. Ooh. But it isn't necessarily just him and it isn't as supernatural. I like that they changed it up a little bit. That's good. That's not a bad thing. They were five deep into the series at that time. Five deep. So it's okay. You had a really good actress as your final girl. There's another one that can we just stop crapping? And I know, I know, Friday the 13th is not my favorite franchise, and I've gotten a lot of heat over it a lot of years because I've been very critical of the movies. I'm sure a lot of people who've starred in the movies would be very critical in the movies. But I know a lot of you love them more than life itself, better than air. I don't know why sometimes, but... Let's stop crapping on my good buddy, Todd Farmer's Jason 10. If we want to leave Friday the 13th Part 5 alone, because listen, there's some turkeys throughout the series. There just is. Then the fact, well, technically they shot the leprechaun into space before they did Jason. Let's leave that alone. The original intent, and because Todd Farmer has been interviewed by me a couple of times, has not made the secret, was to make Jason 10 into Alien. It was Jason as Alien's in space and it makes sense if you think about it and marines have to go in and take care of it and whatnot it's a fun movie it, i saw it i was one of the six people who saw it in theaters and here is what i should say you should do let it go please reach into your inner elsa or whoever whichever one their names are in those um, you know uh, disney movies and let it go because there's a lot of great jokes in jason 10 and I get it. It's uneven because there's blood and then there's horror, but it's a horror comedy. It has one of the best topless kill scenes of all time where he's throwing the bag up against it with a cheerleader in it. And they're like, oh, let's smoke weed. and we're Let's leave Jason 10 and Friday the 13th Part 5 alone. Let's not bother them anymore. Let's walk away. Let's slowly take a breath and go, every year they were making one of these movies. 
hiring young talent to try to get it done, and there was never any thought about five movies down the road. They didn't do it. None of the producers were thinking about that. It's not like Marvel today. It's not like we have Phase 4 of Jason, Phase 10 of Friday the 13th or Nightmare on M Street or Halloween. They didn't think about these things. They were cashing checks. And the fact that we got as good as we did is a testament to some of the wonderful people behind and in front of the cameras because they were trying to cash checks, I assure you. I am going to defend Friday the 13th Part 5 for having the cojones to try something different. And the same thing with Jason 10. Put him in space. You put him everywhere else. He was in New York. He went, he got dragged to hell when then Freddy's Love came and got his face mask. Let's have a good time. Let's not be angry. And let's appreciate what we did get from a lot of young folks who were very talented trying to make the best of, of low budgets and quick turnarounds. This has been Joe Lewis of Bonehead Weekly. Leave Friday the 13th Part 5 alone and Jason 10. And we're back, everybody. We've got just a few minutes left with Melanie Kinman. Final girl from Friday 13th, Part 5. I actually did have one that I... Were you signed to do Part... Did they come back and ask you to do the next sequel? I know it didn't come to fruition, but wasn't that part of, part I, of the lore? Yeah. When I got signed to Part 5, before I shot anything, I was signed for 5 and 6. Okay. And two movies. And part six was going to pick up exactly where part five ended with that last shot of the knife behind. Right. Me. We were, part six was going to start there. When we wrapped uh, part five, I had a month off and they said the next month we're going to start shooting six and they were sending me a script. While I'm waiting, I get a phone call from my agent. They had just heard from Paramount that John Shepard, who played Tommy, mm -hmm. did not want to do part six, because he was signed also, he did not want to do any more horror, and he was done. And of course, I said, well, use me anyway, you know, but you know, but I want to do it and bring in another killer or whatever you, you know, the plan was, the plan was that Tommy was going to be the new killer. Bring in another Tommy. They said, no, they have to scrap the whole thing. They have to come up with a whole new script and a new cast. And they brought Jason back. But part six was not going to have Jason back. I think it would have been very interesting. I think to try something different, think right. out of the box, would have been very interesting. And to continue five and six, continue the story, no Jason, could have been good. I, st I Okay, now I'll say it. I still like, not nothing against you, I still like to see the final girls get bumped off in the sequel. Right. I don't care who does it. I mean, no, if they <laughs> just that's just something I like. Now there was a question from the chat room. Um, okay. They want to know more about what they missed. You had apparently had quite a few cut scenes. Um, mm -hmm. You said character development. Kind of give them an idea of what didn't make what hit the cutting room floor, as they say. Well, I had a scene. Uh, it's after all of the the chase scenes and all the deaths that I witnessed. And then, if you remember, that Tommy's in the hospital in the insane asylum and I go and see him, I have a nervous breakdown and there are scenes with me in a hospital room having the breakdown. I actually have one picture from that that I bring to my table at, at the convention. So I do have the one shot, but that was cut. Um, there were scenes, uh, just conversation development between me and Matt, uh, that was cut. And then I understand I wasn't there, but some violent or some violent killings were cut that now actually that was um if i had to critique the movie for one thing too many people died that off screen <laughs> if i go to a horror movie i'm buying that ticket i want to see him die i want to see i want to see the um red die number five um in the cairo syrup i want to see it hit oh, the floor brutal <laughs> and I want his death to be creative too. Yes. Like, like maybe I agree. Go, I'm kidding. I agree. Like, <laughs> I think we had a couple of creative ones in part five. Yeah, there were. I, there I, were. Like the, I like the one with the the torch in the mouth. That was kind of good. 
the, the that yeah. was good, but now the accompanying scene, the guy in the car that he slid his neck. Oh yeah. Sorry, he died way too fast. Yeah, he Do, died fast. Yeah. I, I think the good kill was also uh, John Ro Robert Dixon. Um, he played Eddie, and he had the strap around the belt around the eyeballs. Mm -hmm. I think that was a pretty heavy scene. That was very creative. The only yeah. thing about that is, I, I I'm sitting there going, why did he have that strap with him? Why did he have that strap with him? The killer? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Well, I guess because he was planning. He's a serial killer. He's <laughs> it, lo it looked like a piece of horse equipment. I, I, I work in a leather food. shop. He had ice picks. He, I mean, the guy had everything. Well, and I realized why, why he would have a machete. Um, but, but to me, that looked like a piece of horse equipment that you'd find, you know, like harness or something. Okay. And I just, and I, it just hit me as like, why do you have that? Now, honestly, yeah. the... The pruning shears through the eyeballs, top mm -hmm. notch, top notch. Yep. yep. So, and and I like the bunk bed kill too. Oh God, that was I gross. Mean, yeah, it was. Yeah. It, it was predictable yet well done. Mm -hmm. That's that's where I would leave that. Um, Katie, you got anything else you want to ask? Um, what's it like being a final girl? I didn't Does know what that term was. I didn't know, like, when we were shooting it and, and after it. I didn't know what Final Girl was, again, till I went to the conventions. And it's, it, it, you, how can I explain it? It's, it's not something you expect. And then when you realize what it is, it kind of gives you a, a um, I'm proud. How about that? I'm proud yeah. only because it affected a lot of people's lives in a good way that they had somebody that they looked up to for a, a strength or a perseverance. So I'm proud. Yeah. It's amazing. I love final girls. Uh, like I just, I wondered if that was like a thing, if, if you knew when you started shooting, no. I'm going to be the final. No, final I, knew, girl. I knew I didn't die. I knew I was the, the last one standing, but I didn't know it was called final girl. I didn't know it was an actual thing. And so it's nice to know that I'm in this special sorority, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, girls. it's kind of badass. I'm just saying. Okay. Yeah. okay. I'll take the badass. I'll take it. Yeah. Now, uh, now for, for the handful of fans we have that uh, might come in the chat room and not make it to Scarefest in October, yeah. got any cons coming up between now and then? I have, let me think, September... 23rd and 24th in Moline, East Moline, Illinois. And I have a special thing uh, on Friday the 13th, October 13th and 14th. I'm going to have to post, look for my post on, on social media and I'll tell you where it is and what it is because they won't let me tell you now. But it's a fantastic idea. It's a great event on Friday the 13th, October 13th, and it's going to be in the Philadelphia area. That I can say. And it's going to be at a haunted attraction. Ooh. Famous haunted attraction. Me. I'm going to be there with a few cast members of Part 5. And what 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 social media do you prefer? I like them all. I, I don't do yeah. a whole lot of Twitter, but I'm on there. But I like uh, Facebook and Instagram. So there you all go. Just yeah. uh, look her up online, and, uh, and you can uh, keep up with what she's up to. And of course, she will be at Scarefest 15 and uh, da, da, October 20th through 22nd, Lexington, yeah, Kentucky. It. That's where we work. And Melanie, thank you so much for coming on thank and putting you. up with me tonight. And everybody, this has been a lot of fun. Next week, we've got the, the council episode. So Brandon Griffith theoretically will be here if he doesn't take off on us, be here to answer your questions about stuff that's going on. Oh, and I was supposed to announce tonight, it was announced in the chat room, they didn't send me the graphic. Tickets are on sale for the Magic Show. Magic Show tickets have gone on sale. Uh, Reed Matcherson's uh, Magic Show at Scarefest. He's come back again this year. This year it's a ticketed event, so uh, go on the Facebook page and you'll find the link. But it's the same place ticket link is. It's, you'll find it. So everybody, this has been Scarefest TV. Thank you very much.